Okay, I think everyone's uh, joining and in now. It's two o'clock now. So welcome everybody uh, to our fifth session on uh, FCS Express 7. And you'll see there's there's me, Kathy Daniels, uh, from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center Flow Cytometry 4 facility. For anyone who's joining us for the first time, welcome. And just below me, you'll see uh, Sean Burke from DeNovo Software, um, who will be carrying out this session today. So, um, like I just mentioned, this is our fifth session. We have, um, during our work from home period, worked on um, quite a few uh, introductory to FCS Express 7 uh, virtual classrooms uh, over the past couple of weeks. Um, and I'm going to show you where you can find that. But today, uh, we're going to focus on using spreadsheets and integrated uh, graphing in FCS Express 7. So I'm just going to go over a couple of introductory slides before I pass it over. All right, so for today, um, when, when talking about those integrated spreadsheets and everything, what uh, Sean is really going to be going over is utilizing Excel-like tools in FCS Express, um, calculating stain index, right? So when we're doing any uh, calculations and trying to figure out the difference between the positive and the negative, um, like for example, with titration data, we'd want to calculate the stain index. So he's going to show us how to do that. Um, looking at bar plots, pie charts, um, some box and whisper bar, uh, plots. So all of those things we're going to go over throughout the duration of the classroom today. Some important links that will be beneficial for you. Uh, first is the DeNovo software link, where you can go ahead and download FCS Express if you don't have it, um, get more information on it. Uh, you can log in to make sure that you can um, reach out for any help that you might need, or there's uh, plenty of educational opportunities available uh, on their website as well. Then we have the core facility website at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center at fccf.mskcc.org. We have recordings of all the previous sessions that went over uh, introductory, uh, like overview of FCS Express 7, compensation and unmixing, cell cycle um, and proliferation, in addition to high parameter analysis utilizing Tizni. Okay, so we have all of those uh, recordings on our website and also on our YouTube. Then we have our Twitter, um, which is the handle at Flow MSKCC. And there we make announcements on any of these virtual classrooms, webinars, uh, events that are upcoming, in addition to educational content such as Flow Post-its that we post every other Monday uh, and all of that. So we encourage everyone to visit our Twitter and follow us. And then we also wanna make sure that everyone's aware of the ISAC website, uh, the International Society for the Advancement of Cytometry. Um, during this time when many people are working from home, they've made Cyto University available for free. And it's a wonderful resource to um, see webinars, educational content, and even um, some past meeting, uh, meeting um, uh, recordings of uh, some sessions that they've had at previous Cyto um, conferences. Okay. Then for anyone that's looking to do flow cytometry analysis but might not have any FCS files, you can visit flowrepository.org, and that website will have um, kind of like a bank of different FCS files that you can go ahead and download yourself to play around with FCS Express um, yourself at home if you don't have any. From there, I encourage everyone to visit um, Cyto, uh, Cytometry Part A journal, which is linked up top in the Wiley link. Then we have uh, MetroFlow, which is our regional New York, New Jersey um, cytometry users group. And actually starting next week from May 11th to May 15th, we'll be doing a corporate member seminar series where we'll have 28 of our uh, corporate members giving um, some, uh, some talks on flow cytometry in, in f over five days. And um, that will be very exciting. <laughs> so um, then we also have our uh, Flowtex um, organization, which is in, uh, in Texas, and they've been putting out a lot of educational content throughout this time, so we encourage you to visit their site as well. Um, and Memorial Sloan Kettering has been collaborating with them, and it's been a really wonderful experience, so um, please go ahead and visit their website um, for some of that content. And lastly, um, we thank David Gravano for showing us how to turn images and text into FCS files through that link right at the bottom in, that, uh, in the YouTube um, video. So very briefly, before I hand it over to Sean, 
please know that um, you can contact Sean at the email address listed here if you have any questions uh, after today. Then there's also Rui Gardner, who's the head of the facility at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and myself, uh, Kathy Daniels, and I'm the manager of the facility there. So any questions that you have, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, and that's after today, but we encourage everyone to utilize the chat function throughout the virtual classroom today. Both Rui and myself will be monitoring the chat and answering questions if, if we can. If not, we'll be um, you know, interrupting Sean at the appropriate time to ask some of those questions. So please feel free to, um, to ask if anything's unclear or if you want anything extra to be shown. We highly encourage it. And with that, um, last but definitely not least, we want to say thank you so much to Sean, who's been such a, um, such a resource to us um, in providing these virtual classrooms for FCS Express um, for the past month and a half, almost two months. And we're very grateful that, um, that they've helped us out with this. Um, so thank you, Sean. And with that, I'm going to pass it along to you. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. So let's get, um, see if I can get my screen shared over here. And just let me know if you can see that coming through. Yeah, we're good. All right, perfect. Great, yeah, thanks again, uh, Kathy, and to, to everybody who's joining us on the call today. And um, for everybody at the uh, MSKCC uh, Flow Court for making, uh, these types of sessions available uh, for us to help reach FCS Express users and um, for everybody who's joining us to um, get some more information about how to use the software. So today we're going to be covering spreadsheets and charting in FCS Express. So as Cassie mentioned, um, in FCS Express we can utilize uh, spreadsheets that are integrated directly into the software. Um, and what that kind of allows you to do is essentially <clears throat> get all the functionality that you would have in Microsoft Excel or even a lot of the functionality in Prism directly in FCS Express and directly linked up to your data. And what that means is as you move a gate, um, anything that's downstream from that gate in a spreadsheet, things like p-values, bar charts, regressions, all of that stuff updates in real time. Um, so it's a really, really cool functionality. Uh, we released it in version six. We kind of continue on in version seven with some new um, tools for it. <clears throat> but essentially what we're gonna do today for this agenda is we're going to first go over some of the basics, um, how to use spreadsheets in general, how to get um, data and information into these things. Uh, but one thing you can kind of keep in mind is that, you know, if you have any questions about how does a spreadsheet in FCS Express work, think about how you would do it in Microsoft Excel. Um, really, just about all of the functionality in Excel is there. Um, even some functionality specific for flow data analysis that Excel doesn't have is there. And what we're going to do is first kind of cover these basics. And then we're going to swing back around and we're going to take a look at some of the specifics for charting. Uh, we're gonna come back around and take a look at how to specifically create a uh, stain index uh, chart, a regression analysis, and then we'll also just show you uh, kind of quickly how to work with some of the box and whisker plots in the software as well. So I'm gonna get started here and um, let's get out of this, this PowerPoint here. And we're gonna go over to, um, FCS Express, and again, I know this looks exactly like PowerPoint. We're actually over in FCS Express now. But again, I can't stress it enough, you know, think about what you would do in Microsoft Excel. Think about what you would do in Microsoft PowerPoint when you're working in FCS Express, and really the same types of things are going to apply. Now, we do have a lot of kind of specific little features um, regarding spreadsheets that I wanna cover today. So I've put in a few of these little uh, cheat sheet, little text boxes here to help guide me. Um, and just so you know, these little text boxes that you can put in FCS Express, they're also a really good training tool. Um, not just for myself to reach other people on a webinar, but if you're doing any sort of self-training in your lab, um, any sort of training that you wanna <clears throat> provide to people, um, you're gonna see me kind of clicking on these things, a little checkbox, and then something else is going to appear um, with a kind of set of steps that we're gonna follow. So keep in mind, if you ever wanna learn more about that kind of functionality, just send, shoot us an email at support at denovosoftware.com and I'll be able to guide you a little bit further through that. 
So when we work in FCS Express, um, and in this particular uh, layout or this case, I've already got a bunch of data inserted here. I've got some plots and gates and statistics. Uh, again, we've covered a lot of this about how to insert these things in some other webinars. But what I want to focus today is on the spreadsheets. And spreadsheets are located in the insert tab and they're located in this little spreadsheet section. And essentially what you do is if you want to get a spreadsheet into FCS Express, you click on new spreadsheet. It's going to prompt you to name that spreadsheet. You can give it the default name if you want, but keep in mind that you can use multiple spreadsheets in the software at any time. So kind of like in Excel, you can have multiple page tabs for different or multiple worksheets. Um, in FCS Express, you just have multiple um, integrated spreadsheets. So, you know, name them descriptively if you're planning on using a few. And these spreadsheets can be moved and resized and put anywhere on the page. You can see it looks and feels kind of just like Microsoft um, Excel when we, when we move these things around or it works like PowerPoint to get these moved around the page. Um, and I'm just gonna find a little place down here that I can insert a spreadsheet and work with this a little bit more on the call today. So let me kind of get this fit to the screen. I made it a little bit too large to start with, but you can see we have it all in this PowerPoint slide now. Um, additionally, when we export to PowerPoint, when we export to PDF, um, anything, if the spreadsheet is on your page, it's going to be exported. So if you have some stats there that you just want to be kind of exported as a static picture, it can go out in that format. Um, of course, we're going to swing back around and we're going to show you if you do want to bring these stats out somewhere else how to do that. So really the first thing we want to do in these spreadsheets is get some information in them. And if you think about Excel, Excel, you just type in some values and same thing works here. And if you wanted to create some sort of formula reference in Excel, you type in an equal sign, you grab a cell, you grab another one, and it returns a result. Right. So the same exact thing goes here. Right. If you have a formula reference, if you change some information in one cell, you hit enter, it's going to update that formula reference. Now, when we're working with flow data, uh, we generally have uh, statistics that come from gates, from plots, from quadrants, and things like that. And it would be a shame if we had to go in here and type in, say, 59.68 in our spreadsheet, right? Um, what we really want to do is be able to link up to this data dynamically in that spreadsheet. And there's a lot of ways to do that. And I think the simplest way of doing it in FCS Express is utilizing drag and drop functionality. So for instance, if I wanted to get some statistics from this particular lymphocytes gate here, um, what I can do is I can drag that particular gate into a cell in the spreadsheet. See if I can get this to uh, drag and drop in here for me. <clears throat> Let's see. Let me close this out because I know I was having some problems with this on a Zoom call earlier. Let's see. Seems like Zoom doesn't want to let me uh, drag and drop things between software for some reason, but we'll see if we can't overcome this. So we'll reopen this layout. Just give it a second to launch up. We'll see if we can get this drag and drop working here for you. All right. And while you're opening that up, Sean, I just reminded everybody that as part of that um, uh, seminar series next week, you're going to be giving a talk on Monday about moving from data to results with FCS Express, spectral, spectral unmixing and beyond. So I just reminded everybody about that. Ah, that reminds me, I should prepare a presentation, I think. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one as well on the, on the MetroFlow series. Um, so again, what I did there was I dragged and dropped into my spreadsheet. And what I'm going to do is say for this particular gate, um, I want some information. Um, so for the lymphocytes gate, I'm going to want to put in, um, one thing is I want to put in the file name for my data. Um, I want to put in the gate that this information comes from, and I want to put in the number of events. So what I'm doing is holding down the control key while I'm clicking on these things, and it's going to allow me to multiple select items. So if there's multiple statistics you want to derive from one drag and drop, it's very simple to do that. And when I click OK, you're going to see here in the spreadsheet, um, that the information in the spreadsheet is getting filled out for uh, my file name, uh, the gate that this information is coming from, and uh, the statistics, which are now directly linked to that gate. So you're going to see that as I move around that lymphocytes gate, 
uh, the statistics in you know uh, C2 here are updating in real time, right? But we know that you don't just have numeric information that comes from FCS files all the time. Um, a lot of times you also have information in the form of uh, keywords. And if you wanna get information in the form of keywords or metadata into your spreadsheet, again, you can do a drag and drop. Generally, if you grab a plot, the plot represents some sort of data file. So when you drag a plot in there, you're gonna have an additional option to choose a keyword. So what we can do is in this little keyword dialog, if you click here, you're gonna see all of the keywords that were put together at the time of acquisition. So a lot of this doesn't really matter to us as a scientist. A lot of this is just kind of information about the data file, um, but there is information that's useful, like the date that you acquired this, the time that you acquired this data file, um, things like the file name, um, you know, sample IDs, other kind of checks that went on with this data. So the more you can annotate your data um, when you're acquiring it, um, I think the better that is. It's better for a lot of reasons, but if you have that information stored, when you use FCS Express, you're always gonna have access to that information. Now there is a keyword in here. I know it's called uh, dollar sign SMNO. This is actually the specimen number. And if I just type in here, I'm gonna call this specimen because I could call this whatever I want. It's gonna put in the specimen number for that particular tube. And now what would happen is if I change data files in my uh, layout, if I move to a different data file, you can see that the specimen ID is updating, the number of events is updating. So all that information in that spreadsheet is updating in real time, um, including metadata that's coming from my data files itself, again, which is um, really super useful. You never have to worry about making some sort of clerical error um, when you're getting information into FCS Express, whether it be a spreadsheet or another place. Now, another uh, type of statistic that you may want is, you know, not just a, a standard statistic that comes from your data, but if you want to do some sort of, you know, custom statistic, and in this case, I'm going to create a ratio of CD4 to CD8. And the way that we do that is again, if you grab a gate or even if you grab a, a statistic, if you drag and drop that into the spreadsheet, the spreadsheet is now going to contain that statistic. And because it's derived from a gate, uh, anything that's in here that's highlighted in gray is information that's actually directly linked to a gate. It's gonna update in that spreadsheet. But again, if I wanted to say grab an entire gate for my CD4, I drag it and drop it in here. It's gonna prompt me, it knows that we're grabbing the CD4 gate, so the gate is already selected, but then I just come in and say, all right, let's use percent of gated cells. So what I can do then is you can imagine in Excel, you would do something like this. You'd enter equal, you grab one cell, you divide that by another, and then you end up with a ratio. But again, the really nice thing about this in FCS Express is as you move one gate, as you move the other gate, as you move a top level gate in the hierarchy, all of those values update for you and you get that information in real time. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, we know that um, the spreadsheets, you don't, you don't always wanna use a full spreadsheet in your analysis. I mean, if all I want is this ratio statistic and I want it shown on the chart or something like that, um, you can use the spreadsheet to calculate the statistic, but if you wanna grab that and move it anywhere else, you can grab it and drag it out. It will open up a new text box and that text box will contain the statistic that's based off of the spreadsheet. So now I have this little text box here. If I wanted to type in CD4, CD8 ratio, I can make this text box a little bit bigger so we can see it. Right now we have the CD4, CD8 ratio in there. And if we wanna use a little bit better precision like we're doing in the spreadsheet, any of these statistics, if you double click on them, it's gonna open up a little dialogue. And you can say for the number format, you know, let's use four decimal places as a precision, right? Um, so in that way, you don't just have to use the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet can be a place that you do the calculation, but if you wanna report that calculation somewhere else and hide the spreadsheet later on, you can do that, right? So just imagine, you know, whatever kind of statistics you would normally produce downstream in Excel with other software or things that you wanna do in FCS Express, just calculate them in the spreadsheet and then you can drag and drop that cell uh, anywhere out and put it into a text box if you want. 
So when we talk about these spreadsheets, um, I talk a lot about, you know, these look and feel like Excel. Um, when you click on a spreadsheet, you're going to see this little spreadsheets tab appearing. And my uh, Zoom window is hovering over that, so I'm going to wait till it goes away. Um, but if you click on layout, you're going to see that you really have all of the options that Excel has here. So if you want to change formatting, if you want to center things, align them, merging cells, wrapping text, uh, things like sorting data, conditional formatting, I'm going to come back and show you about that in a little bit. Um, the sorting function is actually particularly useful for flow data. I mean, imagine you do a 96 well plate and you're looking for GFP expression. Well, you can drag and drop 96 data files into here, as I'm going to show you in a minute, and just sort by the MFI. And then it's going to show you right at the top of the list which well has the highest expression, right? Um, but additionally, there's, there's tools in here if you wanted to <clears throat> clear contents, you know, I can clear all the contents here and essentially that's going to remove everything from the spreadsheet. Um, but again, if I wanted to select cells and delete them, right, I know that's another way that you can do that in uh, Microsoft Excel. You know, again, just remember that kind of functionality is there. So now that I have some of that cleared out, um, I want to show you another way of working with this spreadsheet. Because in this first case, we kind of just took data from plots that existed in the layout. But you never work with one data file at a time when you're analyzing. Um, you generally have many data files, many replicates, a 96 wall plate, you know, whatever it is you might be working with. And all of that data is going to appear in the data list um, when you load some of this in. So if you want to get data across multiple data files into a spreadsheet, essentially all you do is you multiple select the data files in the data list. And just like we did before, we can drag and drop them into some cell in the spreadsheet. And FCS Express is going to prompt you and say, well, what do you want to put in that spreadsheet cell? Do you want to put a statistic? Do you want to put keyword information? And in this case, I'm going to choose a statistic. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, uh, give me information about the CD45 parameter. And I'm going to say, give me information from the lymphocytes gate. And I'm going to say the information that I want is the file name, the number of events, uh, percentage of parent, the median, the arithmetic mean, and the standard deviation, right? So I can grab all of those things with one click. And if you had multiple gated populations, maybe you wanted to grab information uh, from CD4, CD8, lymphocytes, you know, any of your markers or quadrants, you can actually grab all of that information at the same time, uh, which makes it pretty quick and easy to get these things into a spreadsheet. So the spreadsheet's going to populate here. Just give it a second. I know things uh, work a little bit slower when I'm on a screen sharing meeting. Um, on your side, you're probably going to see those things update automatically and kind of right away. Um, but you can see here, now we have information across all of our data files for everything that I asked to put in the spreadsheet. And what will happen is as I move a gate, the information across all the data files as it applies to that gate is updating immediately and in real time. <clears throat> now, I know one of the questions that generally comes up is, well, when I use the lymphocytes gate, that's not appropriate for every single data file that I have in the data list. Um, and if you've been to any of the kind of basic talks that we've uh, put on, uh, when we talk about gating, we always talk about something called data-specific gates. And essentially what data-specific gates do are they allow you to, instead of just using a global gating position across all files, which this is doing here, is if we click on that gate and we go into the gating tab and we say make it data specific, it will only update across, you can see here, in row two of the spreadsheet because that gate is specific for that one data file. And if we move here um, in this particular plot, if we change to a different data file, um, I'll go to one a little bit further down the list. I'm going to make this data specific gate again. Um, I know you can't see it on this side, but I'm going to hold down the shift key. And if I hold down the shift key and move the gate, that will make it data specific as well. So now you can see in row five in that spreadsheet, um, only those values are updating because it's specific for that particular data file. 
Um, so kind of keep that shortcut key in mind as well. I know that's a big uh, kind of helpful tip and trick there. Hold down the shift key when you move a gate, it will make it data file specific. Um, so again, if you need to have data specific gates, if you need to have global gates, um, all of that stuff works just as it normally would in FCS Express and the spreadsheets are going to update accordingly. Um, so, you know, nothing really you have to do or change about the way that you do gating, whether you're using data specific gates or otherwise. Now, in the previous example, when I did a, a ratio, uh, let me get some of this stuff out of the way here a little bit. When I did a ratio in the previous example, I was doing it just for one data file, right? Um, in this case, if I want to do a ratio, um, I'm going to want to do it across all of my data files, right? So I'm going to grab um, all this information again, grab all of our data files. And what I want to do here is get all of that information into here. And I want to do it for my CD4 and my CD8 populations. So again, I'll choose, doesn't matter really what parameter we're using for this one. But if I choose CD4 and I choose CD8 and I come in here and I say, give me percent of parents for CD4 and CD8, what we're going to do is put in a column for CD4 percent of parent. We're going to put in a column for CD8 percent of parent. And we'll have that information represented um, across all of the uh, different data files that are here. So then what I can do, and you can imagine, right, what would you do in Excel um, is you type in a formula. And the formula is going to be one cell divided by another. And if we were in Excel and we wanted to copy that formula down, well, you'd grab on the edge of the cell, you'd drag it down the list, and then that would apply the formula across everything that's there, right? So again, this is pretty darn simple and easy to use. Uh, again, even though that ratio is calculated um, from many different data files, from many different gates, as you move that kind of global gate or your data specific gate, all of that stuff is gonna update for you in real time. Now, when we're working in spreadsheets, and you know, one of the kind of really nice things about working um, with spreadsheets in Excel is that there's a lot of formulas and functionality um, to kind of help you calculate things, right? So if I was in Excel, I would have access to a bunch of formulas. And the same thing here, it goes here for FCS Express, right? If you need to get statistical information, math and trigonometry, if you wanna do your taxes, you can do that here, right? So all of those kind of formula references are here and they work the same way. So if I grab a kind of range of data in my spreadsheet and I click auto sum and give me the average, well, it adds a new column underneath or a new row for the average. And if I grab a range of data here and I say, all right, give me the minimum for that data, it will show me the minimum for that data. And again, just like you know, Excel, as I move uh, some values, all of that information is gonna update. So again, it's really kind of uh, useful. You know, I could think of so many use cases for this, you know, just grabbing the maximums. If you're looking for stain index or the highest expressors, I mean, these are kind of useful formulas to work with. Um, additionally, FCS Express, and you're gonna see this in a little bit, um, has other formulas in here that Excel doesn't have, right? So in Excel, you would probably very rarely ever use a stain index formula because that's very specific for working with flow cytometry data. Uh, but we do have the stain index formula in here. So if you just wanted to grab your um, positives, your negatives, and your standard deviations, those are essentially the variables that you would need for this. And again, I'm gonna come back and show you that later. But again, you know, keep in mind if there's some sort of special biological formula or something specific to flow cytometry data that you use all the time, you're probably not the only one. Um, if they don't have that calculation in Excel, let us know because we can build these things at any time into the software for you um, and make it a little bit more convenient to work with that in FCS Express. Now, when the spreadsheets were introduced, I started learning a lot of things about Excel that I never knew just from working with these things in FCS Express. Um, so if you've never used conditional formatting in Excel, uh, you should check it out. Uh, but you should check it out here in FCS Express as well because it can do some cool things. So if I grab a range of data and I say, give me some data bars for that, 
what it will do is in that spreadsheet, it will give you uh, essentially little bar plots for representing the data. If I grab some information here and I say, give me color scaling, right? You can set up color scaling. Um, you can do things like set up icon sets. I think there's like happy faces in here too, if you wanna give happy faces to your data, right? Um, but again, with the conditional formatting, all of this stuff, including the data bars, updates as you move gates, as you move things around, uh, which again, makes it very easy to quickly come in and say, all right, here's my highest expressors. Here's something that responded to a treatment um, based off of you know whatever formulas that you have. And again, you never had to go out to Excel. You didn't have to go out to Prism to put this stuff together, right? So again, conditional formatting is another uh, type of useful tool that's in there. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, things like conditional uh, or if-then statements. So there's a lot of quality control that I know people are doing with their flow data when they bring it out to um, Excel. So some things like you might have um, some sort of acceptance criteria, some sort of quality control criteria. And if you're working in Excel, you might use something like an if-then statement. And we have all of that, right? I mean, again, it works just like Excel. So if I'm looking at this ratio and I want to assess if that ratio is acceptable, if something's an expressor, whatever it is I want to do, I can type in a formula. And the formula is going to be formatted like this. It's going to be an if-then statement. And essentially what I'm going to say is if the value located in I2, which is our ratio, is greater than 0.9, um, we put in a little comma. I believe Excel is kind of formatted in the same way. We're going to say yes. And if it doesn't fall within that category, I guess if it's lower than that, we'll say no. And then we'll close up that formula with a parenthesis. And we're going to see here that we've evaluated this to being not acceptable, right? And again, if you want to get that formula applied to everything, just drag it, drop it down. And then we can go in here, we can say, all right, well, this one's acceptable, these are acceptable, this one is not. Um, again, anything you want to do to that formula, if you don't like no, and you want to call, let's call it throw this away, right? You can type in anything that you want, drag and drop that formula down, um, and then you're kind of putting together that acceptance criteria, whichever way that you want. But again, you know, this isn't really a course in Excel today, um, but it is a, uh, I just wanted to give you some examples of, of how this can be used. Now, I know you might be wondering, all right, well, how do I determine what these like formula variables are, right? If I put in something like, you know, ANOVA or average, um, FCS Express is gonna show me um, what the name of that formula is, but a little bit unlike Excel, and it's something I know we're working on, is it's not gonna show you any sort of hint about what variables it needs. So it is something that you can go to um, the FCS Express manual to kind of look this stuff up. Um, there's a little button for the manual and the file tab. You can grab it through our website. But for instance, if I go into our manual and I type in stain index, I just type in the name of the formula that's there. The manual is going to jump us over to the stain index formula, right? And it's going to show us that, you know, here's the parameters it needs. It's going to show you what the variables it needs for that. And it's going to tell you exactly how to perform that calculation, right? Um, so again, I think if you're using the formulas that are in the software, you know, you're not deriving these yourself, you know, just do a quick search in the manual, or if you can't find it, just shoot us a note at support, we'll help you out. Um, you'll be able to get that information pretty quickly and easily from us. So when we want to get this data, we want to bring it, you know, not just into numeric format, we want to bring it into a chart. Um, essentially what we're going to do is start using charts in our insert tab up here. So I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit here. I'm going to uh, take this layout out of the way um, and tell you a little bit about uh, some of the charts in the software. Um, essentially you can work with bar charts, pie charts, scatter plots, scatter with regression plots, and the one that's new to us uh, quite recently in version 7 is box and whisker plots. So I'm gonna show you um, another little example and uh, let me find this from my other desktop screen. Um, again, 
pretty much what we're doing here is we're working with uh, the same data, the same spreadsheet set up the same way. Um, I just have a, a few little changes here to make my life easier to kind of present this to everybody. Um, but if we want to do something like insert a bar chart, essentially all we do is select that spreadsheet, go into the insert tab and choose bar. So what will happen is when we draw an object, we're now going to insert a bar chart, right? Um, so we have our file names over here on the X, uh, we have on the Y axis, all of the different parameters that are associated with this bar chart that we can pick and choose. Um, so you can just select whatever it is you need to plot in that particular uh, bar chart and that information is gonna be displayed. But again, since these bar charts are based off of the spreadsheets and the spreadsheets are based off of the data, it becomes really cool because as you move that gate, everything in those bar charts updates, right? And I can't tell you how many times as an undergrad researcher that I, I'd take some data, I'd bring it to my PI, you'd say, oh, this looks really great, but what happens if you move that gate one pixel and you, know, you make a change? What happens to the data downstream? Um, so in the software I was using at the time, I had to copy and paste out to Excel, bring it to Prism and recreate everything uh, just to go back and show him and or show him or her and say, all right, well, let's move it back to the way it was. And again, what we get here is that power of just being able to move that gate a little bit. I mean, we can review this stuff in real time and we can see those changes. Now for any of these charts, bar charts, pie charts, whatever it is you wanna look at, you can always right click on a chart and choose format, or you can double click on it, or you can go up and choose format from the formatting tab. And there's a number of different options in the overlays category. So the overlays category, um, helps determine you know, what you wanna call things, it helps you know, determine what you wanna show on the axis labels, but it can also do some things. You know, If you had standard deviations, you wanna show error bars, well, if you have a row or a column of data that has your standard deviations, well, you can just choose that. You do the same thing in Excel, and now all of a sudden you have some error bars, right? But we really only see the top of these error bars because they're black and they're bending it, blending in with the background. So of course, if you scroll down here, there's a lot of different options, right? If we wanted to change kind of how those bars are displayed, we give it some sort of gradient. Um, if we wanted to change the error bars to be say pink and give them a little bit bigger width, right? Um, you can do any of these sorts of changes. You know, the formatting changes are endless, so I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this. But again, just like you would do in Prism or Excel, you can come in and change the styles and the shapes and these things. And again, what will happen is even if those standard deviations um, are based on the data, you know, that information is gonna update in real time. Now, generally when I throw up an error bar or I throw up a p-value and I show moving the gates and things update in real time, I invariably get the question, well, can't you just move your gates until your standard deviations and p-values are very low, right? Well, of course you could do that. You could do that in any software. Um, you know, in some way or another. So don't do that, right? This isn't for, you know, coming in and changing your gate so everything fits nicely to your ideas of how the experiment will work. That's how grants are lost and Nobel prizes are, you know, taken away and, and things like that. Um, but it is, again, a very useful tool. Maybe you wanna go in and say, all right, let's exclude some outliers. How does that change the data? Let's make the gate a little bit bigger. How does that change the data? Let's explore a different population in here. What does that look like, right? So there are very useful tools. Uh, there's very you know, specific applications where this is useful. Don't use this sort of information for evil. You know, don't try and do p-value hacking and standard deviation hacking. Um, it will catch up with you at some point, right? So that being said, let's uh, move our bar chart out of the way a little bit over here. You can see these things kind of resize nicely um, if you change the size. But another type of chart you might wanna work with is a pie chart. So I'm gonna insert a pie chart. We'll take a look at what this looks like. And of course, everybody's familiar with the pie chart. It's gonna show whatever information you, you tell it to in pie slices. And again, if I double click or I right click and choose format, there's again a lot of different um, kind of options for these things. So if I go into the overlays, um, the value parameter right now is the number of events. So we're actually, we're showing in these pie slices across all the data files, the number of events, right? Um, but if I wanted to change and make this the CD4 ratio, I can do so. 
Um, if I didn't want to show the value on there, I could remove the values. I can put in names, right? The names are probably a little bit long, so we'll do that in a, in a different way in just a minute. Um, but there's also this nice little donut hole, right? So this is another kind of cool way to display your data. If you want to put a pie chart with a donut hole in there, you can, you can do that. Um, but if you want to get a legend inserted here as well, maybe you wanted the pie value stats in here, um, the legends are always available, and this goes for any plot in the software. You can enable the legend, and if you don't like it off to the right, I generally like these things down to the bottom when I have kind of bigger plots uh, or lots of information. You can show that legend, and then we can very quickly and easily see, you know, how this data compares to each other. Um, so again, there's a lot of pie slices here, but there are some really great things. I really like using this for doing um, DNA analysis to show G1, S, and G2. Um, you know, that kind of thing where you can divide populations into, you know, kind of three or four pie slices looks really good and it works really well for, for pie charts. Now, I'm also going to go in here and get this out of the way. We'll, we'll take a look at a uh, scatter plot. Um, right. Sean, just real mm -hmm. quick, I, I actually had a, a personal question um, mm -hmm. about uh, utilizing the stain index formula, if we mm -hmm. go back a little bit. So um, something that we're proposing in our lab is the use of a secondary stain index where you see where for the CD4 and the CD8 um, plot, you have the CD4 positive and the CD4 negative. Mm -hmm. um, what, what we're proposing is that you look at the, sec uh, the stain index, but for CD4 positive and negative, but with the APC size seven stats. Mm -hmm. And then by looking at that, it would let us know if, uh, um, if that secondary stain index is essentially zero, it would equate to perfect compensation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and anything beyond two standard deviations would result in a negative one or plus one, which would indicate to us incorrect compensation or unmixing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if that would be a possibility and then um, as a reminder to everyone, if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to use the chat function as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm just about to uh, talk about the same index in just a second here. But um, yeah, I mean, anything that you can calculate in Excel. Um, if you can calculate that secondary stain index, then you can you can calculate it and you can plot it. You can do whatever it is you want with it. You can have different series of data for the primary and for the secondary, um, and you can even overlay that on charts so you can compare primary to secondary stain index. And we'll we'll get that to that in, uh, in just about two or three minutes here as well. So perfect timing for that question. Thank you, Sean. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, that kind of brings me to working with things like scatter plots and scatter with regression plots. Um, so you may think of a scatter plot when you look at flow data, uh, you know, of course, a scatter plot like this, you know, plotting all of your events. But the difference between a scatter plot here for charts and say a dot plot is that the scatter plot for charts is going to plot, you know, any of your gated events here. I'm sorry, any of your charted events. So if we wanted to look at, say, um, CD4, versus CD8 staining percentages. Essentially, on a per sample basis, it's going to give you a uh, chart reflecting that, right? And the regression plots in the software work just a little bit differently in that instead of just plotting the dots, the regression plots in the software, and again, this is what's going to be useful for stain index, are going to plot um, not just the dots, but they're also going to chart a line. Right. So you can see here that we're putting some sort of uh, fit line in there between arithmetic mean and the median, which in this case, they should be nearly linear. Right. Uh, but again, even with these kind of curve fitting and, and charts like this, see if I can move this out of the way here, as they move a gate, um, all that curve fitting, all that line fitting is, is going to update for you. So I want to go over this in some more detail in the context of stain index, because again, you know, I know we've brought this up. Uh, kind of over and over again throughout uh, a few of the uh, training courses. So let me pull up a little example here of uh, working with stain index, right? Um, Sean, very quickly, mm -hmm. we actually did have another question that popped sure. up about stats. So um, Neil Kamal had said, when I insert stats in the spreadsheet and click on the next sample, all of my other stats become zero and show the value only for the current sample. How do we uh, avoid that? And you know, he's you know they're wondering if maybe they they miss something. Yeah. So essentially, there's um, there's two ways to 
work, well, there's a few ways to work with spreadsheets in the software. Um, so if you need to compare across many different data files um, in the layout, you can drag and drop you know, into a spreadsheet from the data list and, and you can work that way. Um, if you are working with information from one data file, you can drag and drop that into the spreadsheet and kind of create a one-off type of thing. But if you kind of have sets of data and you're moving between different data files, um, one of the options for this spreadsheet is when you format it or you create it, there's an option here in spreadsheet data. Um, oops, sorry, in uh, see where this is. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. It's in a, a little bit of a different place. So when you get data coming into the spreadsheet, say if I drag and drop this in here, um, there's an option in the data source and it says allow data file of this value to change when running a batch or moving between data files. So if you turn this off, uh, essentially what will happen is as you um, move between different data files, let me come back here and actually grab a statistic so it does something for me here. So if I move between different data files, sorry, I just chose a statistic at random that didn't want to populate there, that value will remain fixed. Um, so if you load new data into the layout, it will get created, but if you move between data files, um, it can update. So I, I know it's, it's a little bit confusing and um, generally it's, it's easier if we kind of have a look uh, at some of your data together to kind of figure out the best way to get these things into spreadsheets for you. So if you are running into a problem like that, I, I encourage you to just reach out to us at support at denovosoftware.com um, and somebody on our team can hop on a screen sharing meeting just like this one and we can kind of walk you through and make sure that you're using the kind of best approach and best workflow for your data. Um, so again, like I know there's a few different ways to use these and sometimes if you're moving between data files, um, the information in the spreadsheet can change. But again, if you need to lock down some of that information sometimes, whenever you drag in a statistic or you're grabbing something from the data list, um, there's always an option here in data source um, uh, or in the statistics here somewhere, sorry. Oops, sorry, when I'm pulling from the data list into here, there's gonna be an option to not change that particular value um, as you're moving between different data sets. So again, I'd say just, just reach out to us. We're happy to sit down and talk about that in a little bit more detail um, and we can follow up with you from there. All right. Great, so I was just taking a quick look at the questions. Uh, I didn't see anything else uh, so far, so I'm just gonna kinda switch gears here over to the stain index real quick. So again, when we're looking at a stain index, um, essentially what we're doing, in, in this case, it's an antibody titration. Um, what we're looking to achieve in a stain index is looking at, say, the median of a positive, looking at the median of the negative, calculating the standard deviation and using that, those values as some sort of metric about, you know, how much staining we're getting with a particular sample. Um, so, you know, again, we take the median of a negative, the median of a positive, we calculate the standard deviation of the negative and we multiply that by two. So it's, it's actually a very simple formula to calculate. Um, and in this particular instance, um, what I have is some data on my first page. I've already come through and set up my gates. So I have my positives and my negatives. Um, again, we kind of covered this very similar experience, uh, very similar data set at some point. But what I need to get into this spreadsheet to, in order to calculate a SANE index is, let me pull up my data list here. Again, the median of the positive, I need the median of the negative, I need the standard deviation. And again, to get that information into here, I can drag and drop and I'm gonna choose the statistic. And in this case, I'll choose CD3. I'm gonna choose the positives. I do like to put the file name in there so I know what I'm looking at and I'll choose the median. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get the file name, I'm gonna get the median of all my positive events. And again, if I need to get some more information in here, We'll put in a uh, statistic, and in this case, CD3, we'll choose the negative, and I wanna look at the median, and I wanna look at the standard deviation, okay? So I've got really all the information I need in here for a stain index. 
Um, you can see here that when I pulled in some of these um, information that it had also pulled in some, some headers there. So what I'm gonna do is actually just clear the information there and move this data around a little bit. Um, I just put in some little placeholders there so I don't forget how I calculate this. And really just like Excel, it's gonna be calculated the same way. So if I insert a formula and the formula is gonna equal the median of the positive minus the median of the negative, then we're gonna divide that by the standard deviation times two, okay? And that's gonna result in the SAN index, right? And if I drag this down, I'm gonna grab the SAN index across all of my data files. So really whatever formula you want, whether it be a primary SAN index, whether it be you know that new formula that you wanted to calculate, um, it can be anything you want. You just drag and drop. If you needed something from a different channel, instead of choosing the CD3 channel, choose the APC channel, and you can put in the information that you need. But the stain index formula in FCS Express, just so you see, this will work the same way. And the variables for this one um, are gonna be the positive, the negative, and the standard deviation. So what will happen is when I put that in there, of course, we're going to arrive um, essentially at the same thing because it is the same exact formula that we're using. And again, what I'll do, grab this and drag it down there and then we'll calculate the same index um, across all of our different data files that are here. So once we have this information calculated, we can then chart it. And generally when you're looking at uh, charting something like the SAN index, you're charting that against the concentration of, or the amount of antibody that you're using. Um, so for this particular data set, this information wasn't stored as a keyword, but if you have a dilution series, you might already know about this little trick. If you know that your dilution series always goes by twos, we'll just multiply by the cell above, and then you can fill out the concentrations by dragging and dropping that formula down. So what we're gonna do here is come in and insert a scatter with regression plot. And you can see here that in this plot, uh, by default, we're just labeling these with the column headers here um, in the spreadsheet. So just like in Excel, you do have to tell FCS Express um, with these little spreadsheets that if you want to use, if you have you know, labels in your first row, you check this little box and you can see that that actually appeared in my regression plot here. And what that's gonna allow me to do is select concentration versus stain index, and I'm gonna be able to chart that data. Now, one thing that FCS Express does not do very well just yet is figuring out, or actually it doesn't do it at all, which line fit is most appropriate for your data. Um, so you can see here that we're applying a linear fit. That's just our default. But if you want to change the fit type, you can come over here to the regression fit. If you wanna use something like a Michaelis-Menten, if you wanna compare multiple fit types, if you wanna look at you know, 4PL, 5PL versus Michaelis-Menten, you can do that sort of thing. You can add these in there. And what FCS Express is going to do is allow you to look at the R squareds and all the different values associated with that. So were there, uh, were there any questions that came through? I thought I saw my screen uh, yes. flash in there for a second. No, nope, you're all good. They were asking you about uh, what that question was about the secondary stain index, so I'm just answering that. Uh, oh, perfect. Yeah. All right. So again, getting these regression plots in here, it's, it's pretty quick. It's pretty easy, right? Um, you can get that information really anytime that you want. Uh, but again, what will happen here, you know, say if I go to a two-page view, um, I can go in, I can look at this data. If I change a gate, you can see that it's going to update over there on my stain index plot right away. Right? And we can see uh, what those changes to the gates do in real time. Now I know with this particular data set, uh, we never really kind of reached the maximum. So I'm gonna pull this down just for um, sake of looking at this data set a little bit more deeply. Because generally what will happen, you know, in other software, you're, if you're doing an antibody titration, I, I know a lot of people just kind of eyeball these charts uh, because actually putting in MFIs and creating SAN index values requires them going out to Excel and Prism and doing some other things, right? Um, and even if you're doing this in FCS Express, well, you have this chart 
but you're not really sure yet how much antibody to use. You know that you've probably maxed out somewhere between 10 and 20. So, you know, you might just look at it and say, oh, let's use 15, right? Or let's use 10. But we can actually do this in a much more empirical way using some of the more advanced spreadsheet functionality in the software. Um, that's the last thing I kind of wanted to show you today for this is if we insert a new spreadsheet, essentially what we can do is if we look at this curve, this curve is going to have some sort of plateau. Uh, so generally a michaelis menten curve, which is meant for doing antibody titrations, will have something called the Vmax. And the Vmax is essentially where this data plateaus. Now you can grab that information by dragging and dropping the chart into the spreadsheet. And when you choose statistics, you're going to have regression parameter statistics. And this is also, if you want to get our squared values somewhere in the software, right, you can grab that. But if I wanted to put in the Vmax or the plateau of this data, I can. So, you know, you probably don't want to grab information. You don't want to figure out how much antibody is at the max. But a lot of people like to look at how much antibody to use at 90% of the max. Or you could use 80%, you know, whatever it is you want. But essentially to calculate this, we're going to look at that value times it by 0.9. And then we're going to add, end up at 90% max of 25 stain index, right? So that's telling us that around 25 stain index, that's where our maximal uh, binding is. Now, the last thing you'd probably want to do is you want to say, all right, well, when I hit 25 on this line, how much antibody should I be using at that line? And of course, there's a calculation for that as well. And what that calculation is, and I'm going to spare you the details of it here. Um, we just call this amount of antibody. And what we can do is there's a formula in FCS Express for calculate a regression plot y to x. So if I have a known y value, give me the x value for it. And the way that we calculate this with our variables is we say we have to uh, look at the plot number. Uh, the plot ID, which in this case is plot 32, and the overlay for this particular plot. And again, I know this seems a little bit abstract because uh, we're just entering in some variables here, but the regression overlay is overlay number two. But the uh, y value or the x value that we want to calculate is that this value, and essentially what that's going to tell us now is that at 90% of binding, you have 13.98 microliters of antibody. Right, And again, what will happen there is when we view, say, two pages, if we need to kind of change our gates around, um, you know, change some of this information, look at different populations, you can see that the amount of antibody to use is updating for us, right? So again, if you select different populations, if you save this layout, you bring new data into this, um, you're going to have that result right away and immediately. And there's kind of one last cool functionality, and I think it goes along with uh, Kathy's question as well uh, about primary and secondary is creating overlays for these charts. So if you wanted to create some sort of an overlay, and I'll show you the, the use case for this in just a second, you can actually insert a scatter plot for this. And what we'll do is we'll say in this scatter plot, show me concentration versus you know the stain index. And this is that stain index curve just charted. But if you have multiple um, kind of columns of data, if you have multiple spreadsheets, you can actually drag and drop these things um, onto a chart and you can say add it as an overlay. And in this case, we just get one little red dot because we only have kind of one series of data here. But what we can do is format that little red dot here. And we can say that for this particular plot, we're going to chart that little red dot so that, let's see here, that it's going to be C versus B. And that's going to show me the amount of antibody to use. So again, what this little chart now is giving us is the curve for the stain index from our data files. And it's also showing where our calculated value falls. And again, that's a pretty cool functionality to have. I know we spent some time building this up, but again, what will happen is if you save this layout, you have another you know, set of antibody titration data that you need to bring in. You don't have to recreate this from uh, scratch 
scratch every time. You can simply clear out this stuff in the data list. You can bring in another six or seven data files and all this information is gonna fill out for you. But again, that's how you would kind of accomplish, you know, if you had um, essentially multiple series of data, if you had a primary versus a secondary stain index for something, essentially you create a scatter plot. Um, you can overlay that data on the scatter plot. And of course, if you wanted to do things like connecting the lines and showing the values, um, you can put all that together and get some more information from these things. So the last thing I wanna show, and, and just, just for the sake of time, I'm just gonna show it very briefly today. Um, I did mention that we can work with box and whisker plots in FCS Express. Um, so the way that you set these up, it's the same type of way that you would set this up in Microsoft Excel. Um, essentially what you need for box and whisker plots are some sort of category, um, some sort of statistic to plot for that category, and a group that these things should fall into. And when you have that information and you insert a box and whisker plot, up here, you're gonna end up with a box and whisker plot, right? And what will happen, again, that is linked up to your data. So if you change, um, you know, the gate information associated with that, the medians, the outliers, the standard deviations, all of that stuff is going to update. And again, if you have, you know, a lot of data files in your data list, you just simply drag and drop this stuff in there. And if you were kind enough to annotate your data before it got here, you have drug treatments, you have group information, uh, you know, again, creating these box and whisker plots, very simple, very straightforward, you know, pretty, pretty darn easy to use. So again, I think that brings us to uh, about the top of the hour and a, a lot of the stuff I wanted to talk about today. And I think, again, one of the take homes here, um, really a lot of the downstream analysis you'd be performing um, can all be done directly in FCS Express. Uh, a lot of this, again, is done just like you would do it in Microsoft Excel, right? So if you have any questions about what you're doing here besides writing us at support, right, you can always feel free to do that, but you can always try out what you would do in Excel. Um, and I did notice the one thing I didn't show, because I know that these spreadsheets are not the be all end all, right? I do know people need to take this information and they do need to go out to Excel and they need to need to go out to PRISM for certain things. Um, you can copy and paste this, but I highly recommend selecting the spreadsheet and choosing export. Now, when you choose the spreadsheet and choose export, um, what's going to happen is FCS Express, it's not gonna create one of those simple CSV files. It's actually gonna create an Excel document. Um, so what will happen is when you open this up in Excel, you're still gonna see your formula reference, right? You can even change that formula reference around. You're gonna see any of your conditional formatting. Anything that you put together is gonna to be already there in Excel, and you're gonna be able to pick up exactly where you left off. So don't be afraid to go a little bit crazy with your formulas in FCS Express, because if you take that data out, you're still gonna have it in the same exact format that you probably need. Okay. So, um, oh, sorry, yeah. Sean. Oh, no, it's okay. Um, we just had uh, one of our attendees ask um, just for a little bit of clarity on that 90% max number um, mm -hmm. to get a better understanding of what that was. Yeah, exactly. So thanks, thanks for asking. Um, so essentially, when you're looking at an antibody titration um, and you calculate this curve, or, or really any sort of curve that has some sort of inflection point or a plateau, there's generally some sort of term that describes the, say, inflection point. So if you're looking at an ICEC 50 curve, that's the ICEC 50 is essentially where the inflection point is. When you're looking at something, a curve like this, which is called a michaelis menten fit, um, there's a Vmax, and the Vmax is essentially where this line plateaus and it can't really go any higher. Um, so just, just classically, a lot of people, they won't look at the uh, absolute Vmax value and say, all right, well, let's, you know, um, use that as the stain index where we should calculate the amount of antibody to use. They actually back off of that point a little bit. So they back off 10% of that point and use that as the value um, to determine the amount of antibody to you. So if I looked at this curve and I looked at 29, which is the VMAX plateau, um, it's actually above where we charted here and we would end up with the amount of antibody to use at, at 20, right? But if we back off of that about 10% and leave us a little bit of wiggle room, so to say, it 
breaks that value down to about 26, and then we see the amount of antibody to use is just about 12 microliters. So, you know, you don't have to use a 90% max. Um, this is just something that some people do, right? And that might vary depending on where you are. Um, but if you look at, you know, some of the published literature about antibody titrations and people using the callus mentin fits, um, you may find that a lot of times they're using a 90% of, um, of the plateau value for actually calculating these things. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just um, comment really quickly on that also. So, um, you know, for the user that was asking why, you know, Sean that um, just, just explained a bit of that. Um, different people do have different methods, and there are certain times when you don't want to use the um, point where the antibodies at saturation, because um, it has an impact on the on the spreading of the data as well. So there's a couple of different reasons for that. Um, where if you have a primary marker that's expressed very well, you might not necessarily need to use um, as much antibody as you think you do, and by decreasing it a bit, you can actually reduce the spreading. Um, between certain uh, fluorochromes. So just uh, keep that in mind as well. And, you know, this was more for how to calculate all these statistics and everything like that, but there's also, um, you know, deeper discussions to be had as to why we do some of the things that we do. Yeah, great. That, that was a, a, a much more elegant uh, answer to that question than, than I put forth. Thank, I appreciate that, Kathy. <laughs> Not at all. It's good teamwork. It's good teamwork. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see any other questions that pop through. Um, now is the time if anyone has any remainder questions or uh, leftover questions, so please utilize the chat function. Um, and if not, there definitely will be sending out the, the slides that have all the contact information. I shared also for any experiment specific questions that support at the Naval Software uh, email as well, if anything like that pops up. We're looking good. Anything else, uh, Sean? Or? No, I think that's that's about it for today. And again, if you need some additional resources, uh, just visit the DeNovo software website, contact us at support. Um, if you go to our website and search spreadsheets or really anything uh, related to uh, Excel on the website, you're going to see a whole wealth of information about um, how to work with these things. But again, I always I always tell people, reach out to us at support. We can sit down, we can work with some uh, of your own data together on your own computer. And I know that's um, probably the most beneficial way to train for a lot of people. So, you know, again, thanks thanks again, Kathy, and uh, to the, the core at Sloan Kettering for, for putting these together over the last five weeks. We really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to everybody for coming out today and listening to us talk for about an hour here. Yes, of course. Um, and, and also just so everyone knows, we're, um, as we start to do a partial reopening of our core facility, um, we're not necessarily going to be doing events like this on a weekly basis, but we're going to absolutely be continuing with our educational endeavors. Um, so feel free to visit us on our Twitter um, handle at MSKCC or Flow MSKCC rather, um, as we'll you know be be continuing this ed uh, education adventure. <laughs> uh, and we hope everyone stays safe. And again, so many endless thanks to Sean for being so wonderful um, throughout all of this. Okay, thank you everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.